Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to the medical talk. Today we have a very special guest with us. I am honored to have him here with us today. I do not think that he needs an introduction. I think every single medical student across the globe knows him, knows his voice and can recognize him in a second if you hear his voice because we listen to him almost every day and I'm so honored to have him here with us. I do not think that he needs an introduction but we have with us Dr. Jason Ryan, the founder of Boards and Beyond, a resource that has completely changed the way medical students perceive medical education and understand diseases and pathologies. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Ryan. It's an honor. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So Dr. Ryan, we usually start the conversation by talking a bit about early life and where were you born and raised and what was your early education like? Mm. I was born in Miami, Florida, actually, even though I only lived there for a year, so I have no memory of it. Uh, but mostly I grew up in Trumbull, Connecticut. It's about 45 minutes from where I live now. Uh, my father has a PhD in chemistry and my mother has a PhD in education. And so they raised me with obviously a focus on education and achievement and those sorts of things. And so then I went to college for chemical engineering and after working for a year, went back to school for medicine and that's how I got to medical school. So why did you decide to do medicine and why not just continue with engineering? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, I had a job for a year and I got to see what engineering would be like. And, and it's a great field, but it was the work was a lot of cubicle work and solitary work. And I really wanted something more interactive with people. And I think that's why a lot of people go into medicine. They like science, but they want to apply science in a way that's you know, exciting and where there's lots of people around and medicine is really a unique way to do that. Do you think that your engineering education, the things that you learned during that time period helped you or changed the way you work as a healthcare professional right now? Yes, definitely. I mean, I had to learn a lot of math. So I got good at the math parts like physiology that I know are a struggle for everybody or for some of us. I've always been better at things like physiology than strict memorization, things like microbiology. Uh, and so I always had a knack for, you know, tech things and, and, and numbers. And that helped me a lot for sure. That makes sense. I think that's really helpful because some people find physiology very difficult because of the math that comes in. Yes. Yeah. So Dr. Ayn, first of all, I would like to thank you on behalf of all of the medical students across the globe for creating something like Boards and Beyond. <laughs> and I think a lot of people have this thought in their mind that how did you come up with the idea of Boards and Beyond? What was the thought behind it? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you like it so much. Um, I, I never knew when I started it would be like it is today. Um, one of my students, so I was teaching at the University of Connecticut, and, and the students liked my teaching style. They said, oh, Dr. Ryan, you're good at explaining things. We wish you could teach us more things than just your few lectures. And then one of my students showed me Pathoma, which you may know, uh, made by Hussein Sitar, who's a pathologist in Chicago. And that was like a light bulb moment because he teaches in a style like mine, I think. Um, and those videos were, are very simple to make. I mean, they're not high tech. And so after I saw that, I started looking into it and I said, wow, you know, with some simple equipment at my desk, I can record my videos. Uh, and so I took a leap of faith and I had to spend a lot of money to build the website because a website that streams videos and accepts credit cards is very complicated and sophisticated. Um, but then I launched it in 2014 and initially it just had 45 videos in cardiology. Um, and nobody paid for it for about six months. I was giving it away for free. In fact, the, the first time someone paid for it, I couldn't believe it that someone actually had paid money finally <laughs> after all these months to buy it. It took a couple of years till it really got established through word of mouth. But now it's this huge thing that, you know, you know, lots of people use all over the world. And I'm just so humbled and amazed that it got to this point. Uh, and I'm so happy when I hear people like you say how helpful it is to them. I think it's a big contribution to the field of medicine. And I think it will stay forever. Dr. Ryan, I know why I love Boards and Beyond. But what do you think, what are the, some of the reasons that make this video resource so popular amongst all of the medical students? Yeah, I mean, I can't say for sure, but from talking to people like you, some of the things I think are, I always build my lectures around first aid for the boards that even before boards and beyond that's what I did when I lectured to UConn students, because I figured, if I'm going to teach someone about cardiology, 
I know that most of my students will never be a cardiologist. They'll be a radiologist or a psychiatrist or OBGYN. So, you know, they're not going to use much of what I teach them directly the way I use it. Yeah. So what can I focus on that's relevant to all learners? And everyone has to pass the boards. Yeah. And the boards test some important things that are relevant. So I always start with that. Like, what's first aid? Because first aid is such a good book. And it tells you really all the things that are going to come up on the boards. You can't really learn from it, but it lists what the things are. Yeah. So I start with that. Uh, and then... Basically, when I teach, I try to just use very simple language. I think that's a really, it's very easy when you're used to talking to other physicians to use the language that we all understand, but then you forget that you're talking to first and second year med students who don't do this every day. So I try to use very simple language and just sort of walk everyone through it the way I think about it. Um, and then lastly, I try to throw in clinical pearls whenever. I mean, as much as possible, if you're going to bother learning all of biochemistry, you might as well re point out where your uh, the pathways are important to different diseases and things like that. So I think that's the way I always taught, even before Boards and Beyond. And, you know, it's just sort of caught on because people want to understand what's in first aid but have trouble finding someone who can explain it to them. A lot of my seniors have recommended using Boards and Beyond videos alongside First Aid because they're so similar to each other and complement each other really well. So it really yeah. helps when studying for the Step 1 exam. So Dr. Ayan, Boards and Beyond also has a new edition called the White Coat Companion. So what was the thought behind the White Coat Companion and how can medical students benefit from it? Sure. So the White Coat Companion is a book written as a collaboration between myself and Michael Lorinsky, who's an attending physician at Master general in Boston. He used to be a student of mine. Um, and he really thought that the books available for step two, none of them were just right the way first aid is for step one. None of them have what you need for the wards and for your step two exam and your shelf exam. So he set out to put this book together that would meet that need. Uh, mm -hmm. I helped him edit it and the two of us published it together, but it's really meant to be you know, our goal is to be like first aid for step one, but for step two and your shelf exams. That's great. I think that will be a very good addition to the medical education curriculum as well. So talking about the step one exam, a lot of medical students, when they start off preparing for the step one exam, they feel very overwhelmed by the amount of information they have to learn and they don't understand how to create a good schedule for themselves. So do you have any advice for students who want to create a study plan for the step one? Yeah. So I've been advising students for many years. And one thing I've learned is everybody's different. So that's both good and bad. It's bad because you'd love to just take out a recipe and follow it exactly and know that it will work, but there is no such thing. But it's also good meaning if someone else tells you to study a certain way and you're trying to do it and it's not working for you, that's okay. That that's In fact, that's really normal. So it's okay to craft your own plan. But in general, you know, I think now that step one is pass fail, people aren't worried about maximizing their score. They just want to pass. But really, it is a big test covering a lot of material. It's hard to learn it all in a month or even two months. Yeah. So you really need to study for it steadily over your first two years. You know, as you learn things in school, you keep an eye on what the boards are going to test from that topic and maybe do a little bit of practice questions and watch some videos. Uh, because if you get to your dedicated study time and the test is four or five weeks away and you say, okay, now I'm going to learn it all. It is really a lot of material. You have to already have a foundation when you reach that point. It's a lot. I think, as you mentioned, that it's better if you start from the first year and yeah, maintain a balance. Absolutely. When we're talking about the step one exam, there are a lot of things that are tested that involve rote learning and a lot of memorization. So do you feel that there is a need to make some changes to the curriculum of the step one exam or the things that are being tested on the exam. Yeah, I mean, I wish the exam would get modernize itself. There are lots of things, you know, if, if you have a who is pregnant and allergic to the first line treatment for Lyme disease, you can look that up in a, two, a few seconds. And I don't think it makes sense for the boards to make you memorize that. Uh, they're, they're trying to get away from that. There's less of that, but there still is some of it, unfortunately. And th this is just because things like board exams are very slow to change. And, you know, I hope one day there'll be some kind of open book format, you know, where you can look things up. Uh, you still would have a time limit, so you can't spend an hour looking up the answer to one question. It would sort of mimic what actual practice is like, where you have to look things up quickly in a targeted manner. But at least for now, there is unfortunately a fair amount that you have to memorize, or at least you have to have been exposed to it so that you can think it through when you see the question.
Uh, the thing you mentioned about an open book exam, I think one of my teachers did an experiment like this where she took an exam the normal conventional way and then she took an open book exam and the open book one was more difficult mm. for them because you need to be very fast with it because you have a time limit. Um, right. No, it's true. But that's actually a skill that you need to practice medicine yeah. these days. You know, I often see things that I, I'm familiar with it, but I don't remember exactly the yeah. dose or what the drug does or the interaction and I have to quickly look it up. So you know, when you test it that way, you are testing what clinical practice is more and more like these days. Now that the step one is pass and fail, I believe that a lot of IMGs had this advantage when it came to the step one score and even US medical graduates because they could differentiate themselves from the other applicants. Now that it is pass and fail, what do you think they can focus on more to stand out among all of the other applicants during the math cycle? Well, let me tell you, first of all, to be completely honest, I spend most of my time with American medical students like UConn students, and that's how I trained. So I'm less familiar with the IMG pathways, but I have spoken to a lot of students like you through work with Boards and Beyond and learned a lot. So one thing I can tell you is there are always going to be spots for IMGs in the United States. There are simply too many spots. The United States graduates can never fill all those spots. So before pass fail, for example, if the United States took 5,000 IMG graduates, it's still going to take 5,000 IMG graduates. So nothing's going to change. The only thing that's going to change is they no longer have that step one tool to use to help select those 5,000 IMG graduates. So what are they going to use instead? First, they'll probably use the step two score to some degree. And then they'll also probably use history. So if students from your medical school have often gone to certain programs in the US and performed well, they're going to know that your medical school produces strong graduates and you will have a better shot when you apply not because of your step one score or anything else, just because of the school that you're from is one that the program recognizes. So I think probably that sort of recognition of, of, of students in the past who've come from certain places is going to play a greater and greater role because there'll be less of these tools like a step one score to screen people by. Recently on Twitter, you posted about research publications and there was a lot of conversation around that. So what are your thoughts regarding the number of research publications? Because they, we have noticed a trend where a lot of medical students focus more on the number of research publications they have rather than the quality of the work they're producing or the skills right. they're learning. So what are your thoughts regarding that? Yeah, well, I, I've seen a lot of students over the years pursue research vigorously, mm -hmm. so much so that they neglect their studies and they underperform on their class exams and their shelf exams and their clinical rotations. And so my first biggest piece of advice is don't do anything in research until you're sure you have enough time to perform very, very well in all the rest of your standard med school activities. Mm -hmm. Now, if you feel like you have enough time to study for your shelf exams and your rotations and also fit in research, then I think research is a good idea. It can help you get an interview or distinguish yourself. Um, publications are always the best, but they're very hard to get. You know, a it takes about five years from the time a study is conceived till it comes out in print. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you're going to join a study in your second or third year of med school that will be published before you apply your fourth year is very difficult to do. And a lot of students get very upset that they've done research, but they haven't published. Mm -hmm. And I have still seen many students like that match. They can still write that they have research experience. They have something to talk about at their interview. So research is, is, is a great thing as long as it doesn't compromise your foundational studies uh, and you should also know that getting the publication can be hard. It's just that's, ju that's just normal that publications don't come easily. Yeah, that's true. That makes sense. Talking about the USMLE and the math cycle, there is a lot of conversation on Twitter as well around personal statements. A lot of applicants write that they cannot put all of their thoughts on paper and write an impactful personal statement. Do you have any advice for students who are struggling with that right now? Yeah. I mean, my biggest piece of advice is if you struggle writing a personal statement, you're completely normal. No one likes to write these things. They're just not easy to do. Most personal, sta I tell in my estimation, this is not official, but about 5% of personal statements help an applicant, about 5% hurt an applicant, but for 90% of students, it's in the middle. So you should just aim to write something in the middle, something very simple that explains your motivation to go into medicine, maybe something that highlights a few of the things in your application that you want to point out. And that's really the best you're going to be. You're not going to be able to write some essay that makes the reader 
cry and want to meet you, you know, more than anyone in the world. It's just impossible to do. So, so, and most of us don't have some experience like we survived war and famine or something that we can write about. So that's okay. Just aim for a nice, solid, middle of the road essay that doesn't offend anyone and that just sort of points out some of the interesting characteristics of your application. And then above all else, make sure it's well written. I mean, I've seen a lot of personal statements with typos and poor grammar, and I can't follow what they're trying to say. So make sure you have several people who are experienced copy editors read it over for you to make sure it reads well. Dr. Ryan, when you're taking interviews, a lot of people, especially the match 2023 cycle is coming up and the applicants are confused about what interviewers really look for during an interview. So what are some of the things that you really like when conducting an interview in an applicant? And what are some of the things that you do not like and do not want people to do when they're coming up for interviews? Yeah, um, this is a good question. And I will tell you, this varies a lot from interviewer to interviewer. Sometimes we have days where we interview candidates for fellowship and I'll talk to some of my colleagues and I'll say, oh, I, I really liked so-and-so. And they'll say, oh, I, I didn't like that person as much, but do you like this person? I'll say, oh, I didn't get, wasn't that impressed with the person. So unfortunately you're in a very murky gray world here where there's no perfect way to play it. But some principles that I think always work is, First of all, as much as possible, just try to be at ease. You know, don't try to outthink the interviewer and, and craft a clever answer, clever answer. Just be who you are and act enthusiastic. You know, you, you want to meet applicants who you think are excited to be there. And if someone looks sort of bored and drabbed, uh, that's just not going to inspire you as much. Um, and then everybody's different, but I like applicants that express some sort of understanding about what patients go through when they're sick. So. I almost always ask applicants to describe an interesting case. And if all they talk about are the patient's lab values and they never sort of mention what the patient's feelings were and how it was talking to the family, that, that always worries me a little bit that this is someone who might be too technical. Uh, so that's one thing I care about. Now, not everybody may care about that. So other interviewers may not, but you know, I want them to tell me about a case that's an interesting case where they learn something. But then I also like if I hear a little bit about what the patient's experience was and what they felt like so that I know that this applicant gets what patients go through when they're sick. I feel that during medical school, you're so involved and caught up in all of the technicalities that sometimes people forget that the purpose of being a doctor is to be empathetic with the patient and really understand what the patient is going through while treating the patient. I, I agree 100%. And so that's one thing I'm looking for. If all they talk to me about is the ejection fraction and the troponin value and the angioplasty stent. I'm glad they learned all that and that they find the cardiology aspects interesting, but I hope to hear them say something like, and then at the end, the woman felt better and she was so grateful. And we explained to her and her husband what was going on and saw them in follow-up. I always like to hear that human side of the case that they describe. When we're talking about the USMLE exams and the medical education, you are a big part of the medical education in the world right now. So what are some of the changes you want to see in the curriculum and more than the curriculum, the way that teaching is done in medical schools? Yeah, well, at UConn, we've switched to a team-based learning where we present cases and students work through them in teams and we discuss them with faculty. So problem is there's still a lot of material on the boards and we can't get to it all in that team-based learning format because it's obviously a slow format, you know, to go through an entire one case mm -hmm. of cardiology might take two hours and you only have a couple of those meetings a week. Um, so we're always limited by the fact that students have more to learn. They don't have time to just go slow and focus on what we want. So I don't know that anyone's figured out the perfect way to educate medical students, but um, things are shifting to be more clinical, early clinical exposure, lots of interaction with the patient. So I always think that's good because really this field is based on experience. You know, you can ace all the exams, but until you've seen 100 patients with a myocardial infarction, you know, you're not going to be able to handle it. So the more students get out and see actual patients, I think that's better for everybody. While you're working with medical students, what are some of the qualities that you feel that medical students in our generation are lacking? And what qualities do you think that they need to adopt more? I, I don't see any qualities that are across the board lacking, you know, in the generation of med students. But in general, you know, I want to see students that are enthusiastic to be there. Um, and then students really should ask questions, I think. It, it lets me know that they're thinking, you know, when they ask questions. And my favorite questions that are for students to ask are when, what you want to, this is hard to do as a student, you're often focused on what does the attending want me to know and how can I show that? But 
Try to imagine you're taking care of this patient by yourself with no one to help you. What would you want to know then? And because those are the questions the fellows ask me, you know, they say, Dr. Ryan, would you order a echocardiogram on this patient? You know, would you see him in follow up in one week or two weeks? These are all questions fellows ask because they're going to be in practice on their own soon. And the more medical students do that, the standout medical students often start doing that very early. You know, they start saying like, so if this person had come in a day earlier, would you have done the same thing? And, and I can tell they're like putting themselves in my shoes. And I always like to see them trying to do that. So whatever you can do to ask questions politely without being too pushy, I think is always a good thing. I think it shows the curiosity and it's good to be curious as medical students because that helps you learn more. Right, right. Always try to imagine yourself being alone and in charge. I know that may seem really far off down the road and try to think what you would do. And if you don't know what to do, that's okay. But then try to ask, mm -hmm. you know, okay, so for everyone with chest pain, should I do this or should I do that? You know, you're trying to get to that level where you can operate on your own. When you get to the point where you can predict what the attending will do, that's yeah. great. I mean, that often comes later in training and residency and fellowship. But when you say like, this person needs to go to the operating room, you know, or this woman needs to be induced for labor and, and then your attending does it, you know, that's where you're really starting to operate now at a high level. But Dr. Ryan, when we're talking about the MAD cycle, what qualities do you think that program directors look for in their applicants and the people they want to have in their residency programs? I mean, I think the biggest thing is people who are just going to be good learners and reliable residents. So they want to see evidence that you uh, are able to do your job well, you know, that you show up on time, that you work hard, that you get along well with others. These are really basic things. I I, most people I know are not looking for this super fancy stuff initially. They just want to know that you're going to be a solid resident who will, you know, work hard uh, and make the program a better place for everyone because people who work hard and ask good questions and are easy to work with make life more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the basic qualities. And they get a lot of that just from talking to people and interacting with them and sort of imagining yourself being on call with this applicant and what would that be like. Once, once you recognize that this applicant seems solid and, and, and fun to work with, then sometimes you look for other things like, do they have research interests? What are their career goals and so on? When we're talking about medical students, and especially the math cycle, there is an issue where there is a lot of burnout when you're in that process, especially for medical students. Do you have any advice for students regarding burnout and how to have a better work-life balance? Yeah, you, you have to find things you love to do by yourself, mm -hmm. whatever that may be. You know, I love to play basketball uh, and go running. Uh, other people swim. Other people uh, go to the movies, read books. I mean, whatever it may be, but you need to find those things and make sure you do them. Uh, if you're only focusing every day, all day long, thinking about the match and my interviews, uh, you're going to burn out. So th the more, and this is true through all of training, you know, find out that thing for you that you like to do and make sure, you know, you do it every day or every few times a week. Uh, it's more important than ever. I, I used to go to the gym a little bit before medical school, but in medical school, I started to feel like I had to go to maintain my mental health. That was like an hour where I just didn't think about anything. And I felt so much better after I did it. And so for me, that exercise and things like that have always been something I can do to escape. I think it's very important to not let go of the other parts of your personality while being in medical school. So, I agree. Yeah, totally. Dr. Ryan, you are contributing so much to the medical education right now and are teaching medical students, are working as a healthcare practitioner. What are some of the changes you think that will happen in the next 10 years in medical education? Boy, I, I really don't know. I mean, there's a move towards team-based learning across the U.S., less and less strict lecture format and more problem solving with groups of students. So I think that'll continue. There's talk that the step two exam might go pass fail. I don't know if that will happen or not. Um, but, you know, I think there are definitely some educators who want to take away the competitive aspects mm -hmm. and they want to say that not that this applicant is better than the, this other applicant. They just want to say both applicants have met our standards graduating medical school. Um, and I can understand why they want to do that, but programs do have to somehow sort applicants and decide who they want to interview. Uh, so there'll always be that balance. But other than that, it, I mean, it's so hard for me to predict where it'll be in 10 years. I really don't know. Do you have any advice for medical? Medical students who are currently in their first and second year of medical school and are just starting the journey in medicine. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I mean, some of the things I tell students who I advise is, first of all, 
try as hard as possible not to worry about what everyone else is doing. You'll just stress yourself out. Um, and you know, when you ask your classmates, what are you studying? They're, most of us aren't going to say, oh, I just did a hundred questions and I bombed them all. You know, we're going to say, oh, it's going okay. You know, I read a few chapters. So they're going to give you the best version of what they're doing. And that's just going to make you feel more tense. Really try to put blinders on and just do your own work. And, you know, you can spend time with your friends, but definitely don't worry too much about what other people are doing, because uh, that is one of the things that will stress you out. And other than that, uh, this, as much as possible, try to have fun. Uh, if it feels like a grind, you know, it's just going to continue until you burn out. You want to really, as, I mean, it's cool to learn all these things. Uh, how often do, how many people get to see a baby get delivered or see surgery or understand how all these organs work? So try to like capture that fascination and find something to have fun. Dr. Ryan, I think a lot of medical students, I think most of us in Pakistan have this question that do you ever plan on visiting Pakistan or coming <laughs> to a lecture or just visiting here? Because it will be a great, great, great moment for all of us. I would love to. So, uh, I tell you what, if the opportunity ever arises to come there for any reason, I'll let you know first, okay? Because, yeah, I would love to come in and meet people. The coolest thing, mm -hmm. there's so many amazing things that I did never expected Boards and Beyond to get to where it is today. And there's so many great things about it, but definitely a huge one is meeting students like yourself from around the world in places, you know, I've never visited and maybe never will. Uh, and we get to connect like this. It's an honor for all of us to listen to you. And I think that everyone will really enjoy this conversation. Thank you so much. It was a huge honor for me. I could have never imagined talking to you live like this. And thank yeah. you so much. I hope to see you again soon. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.